Great. So this is going to be a short one. Uh, who here writes server code? Yeah, that's a, a fairly substantial number. Uh, do you have any data validation in your server stack? Pretty much everyone. Cool. Uh, okay, so Accord is an open source data validation library that we uh, that we use at Twix and develop at Twix. It's oh, sorry about that. Fully open source. You can come on. <laughs> yeah, some technical difficulties. Right. So it's an open source data validation library uh, that we developed and open source Quix. Uh, it's really available, obviously, for you to use. Um, I hope it's pretty well documented, and that's what I'm going to show you. So to start with, I have a dream. And in my dream, data validation is almost trivial uh, to implement. So in this case, in this example, we have this case class of person that has just two fields, first name and last name. And we, I, I would like to be able to, uh, you know, specify my validation rules in as simple a way as possible. So in this case, um, I have here an implicit value person validator. So validation is a case class in a court. It is a type class, sorry, in a court. Um, I define a validator over the type of person, and the way I actually define validation rules is I have this, you know, I give a name to a sample object. Let's call it P for person. And then I can write p.firstName is not empty, p.lastName is not empty. And that is the premise that we started off with. And the reason we did that, so in comparison, uh, is because we used to use, we have a legacy Java stack, probably the same as most of you uh, who have migrated to Scala. We used to use JSR 303, uh, which is called Beam Validation. So Apache Bval is an implementation of JSR 303. And that sucks, and I'm going to showcase why. But first, let's, uh, you know, let's complete the picture with usage. So how is it used? Well, basically, I have this validate function that is static. I give it a person, and if it validates, I get back a success object. Trivial. More importantly, what happens when validation fails? So I validate the person who has no first name, but does have a last name. And what I expect to get back is some sort of failure model, right? So I get back a failure with a set of violations, you know, things that have violated the rules that, that were predefined. And in this case, I have the value empty string that violated the constraint must not be empty. And most importantly, it has a description. And in this case, the description is the name of the property that fell validation, which is first name. So this is literally what we started off with in terms of design goals. And it ended up being an open source library called the core. So contrast to Beam Validation, which a lot of you probably know. Right? Beam Validation is annotation based. Right? You, you import javax.annotation.blah. And then you have these at size, at not null, et cetera, et cetera. You know, various constraints that you can annotate your fields with. Now, that kind of works fine in Java because Java has a very limited, uh, you know, expressivity in its types. But really for Scala, it doesn't work so well for two reasons. First, because these are, you know, because it's intended to work on Java beings and it uses reflection, then you need to explicitly specify what it is that the annotation annotates, right? So it could be a getter, it could be a setter, it could be the field. In this case, it's the field that we're interested in because that is how the invalidation actually uh, does its processing. Uh, so you need, you have this really, really uncomfortable syntax to work with. At size, at field, uh, not null, at field, etc., etc. Um, so it's really messy. Uh, it's very hard to compose. So if, for instance, you have uh, a field that is an option of string, then you don't get any out of the box support for options, obviously, because that's a Scala concept. But if you want to compose this notion of size limit with this notion of does this option have a value, you actually need to define an annotation. And defining annotation in Scala is also not particularly fun because you only get compiled annotations that get erased, get erased at runtime. Being validation is a runtime reflection mechanism. So it actually becomes very, very hard to compose validation rules with being validation. And it's also incidentally ugly because, you know, you work in Scala, that means you have to annotate with this at field stuff. It just adds a lot of complexity to your uh, domain classes, which really, really, really sucks. 
For the core, the same validator would look like this. You have your address validator, and you literally have one one rule per line, right? And it's a pretty fluent DSL. So, for instance, you know your address sample object a dot tag has size, you know, smaller or equal to 100, and is not null. Or if it's an option, you can do a dot address, or if it's collection, same thing. Dot each has size, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you get this this fairly rich. Uh, domain-specific language to define your validation rules in a, in a pretty concise manner. And because it's a type class, it's not part of your domain class definition. So you can have your case class, and then your validation, and then anything else that has to do with the class. And it's not all intermingled. Contrast with Scala Z validation, which is sort of the go-to solution for a lot of Scala people. Well, there are fundamental differences in philosophy between Scala Z validation and core, but uh, they boil down to the fact that Scala Z validation obviously is part of Scala Z. Crucially, it, it relies on Scala Z idioms. So, if you've actually tried to use Scala Z validation and you didn't just copy paste an example and try to work with that, you would have run into something like validation NEL, which is an a alias of validation, which is an alias of you know, it, it builds on this stack of Scala Z idioms and concepts that you may not necessarily be familiar with. And then you get the applicative functor syntax, construct your objects, it all gets very, very complicated unless you're already vested, you know, invested in Scala Z. So if you do not want to learn Scala Z, really this is not the, the solution for you. Um, on, the, on the other hand, um, Scala Z validation is actually very powerful because it's so abstract. So you can you know, you can plug it in, you can do all sorts of interesting stuff with it. But once again, you have to learn the stack. Accord, in terms of design principles, is designed to be extremely minimalistic. It has no, like, literally zero external dependencies. It's very small. Uh, it's got a very straightforward API. It's domain specific, right? It deals with validation. It's not this cute uh, construct on top of a very massive library of concepts that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, in terms of architecture, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, basically a core comprises four parts. You have your API, which I've shown you at the beginning. You have a combinator library, because matchers is, you know, we had to come up with our own word, right? <laughs> you can't just use matchers. No, we had to invent our own word for it. So we call them combinators for whatever reason. You have a DSL for defining validation rules. And then you get a macro uh, that actually transforms your validation rules into type classes. Now, what do macros have anything to do with it? Just a quick, oh, okay. First off, in terms of features, you get all these things. You know, you get Boolean matching, you get uh, equality, numeric matching, ranges, strings, all the, all the things that you would expect in a sensible matcher slash combinator library, uh, pretty much you get out of the box. Why macros? So this is how you define validation rules, right? You'll notice that there are no strings here. But the resulting object actually gives you two things. It gives you an implicit AND between these two things. Uh, valid, um, a validator in court is entirely, uh, is entirely um, declarative, right? It doesn't actually do anything in of itself. It's just a function from your type to the result model. So the macro, the first thing it does is it takes all the rules and wraps them in a nice AND combinator to save you the trouble and the ugliness of having to do it manually. But more importantly, it generates descriptions. So if you remember the sample result I've shown you, it had the string first name in it, described the thing that failed, right? The, the only way to get at it is through compile time, basically reflection, through reasoning about the result of compilation. And the core does not do any runtime reflection at all. So that is why a macro is used to actually analyze your code and figure out the right description uh, for properties that you're validating. And you can obviously override it with an explicit description if that's your bag. In terms of features, type safe, zero dependencies, it supports Scala 2.10 to 11. It actually, this is an old slide deck, it actually supports 2.12 as well, even though that's a bit wonky because it's pre-production. Uh, it supports Scala JS. Uh, it's Apache license, fully open source. Uh, it has built-in integration with Scala test and Specs 2 um, and Spring. The Spring integration is actually a little bit rough around the edges because there aren't that many people interested in it. Thank God, uh, but if you need that and you have some ideas on how to improve it, please do get in touch. And in terms of Accord, that is all I have. So if you want to check out the library, 
Uh, you can obviously Google it, or you can go to wix.github.io slash record. There's a full-blown website with documentation. There's a Gitter channel. Uh, you know, any contributions, comments, feedback, more than welcome. Um, and that's it for report. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. Can you please touch a little bit more on the integration with this framework? So the question uh, that the request really was, can I uh, touch a little bit on integration with test frameworks? Um, I can. It's actually pretty simple. You get a set of matchers. Uh, that allow you to test your validation. So you can run a validation, get a result, and say, you know, result should be a success or should fail with a certain constraint that had been violated. It's not, you know, it's not huge, right? But it's it's useful in case you actually want to run unit tests on top of validation results for your objects. Um, future plans include a whole bunch of stuff, internationalization and stuff. One of the things I'm actually considering is adapting specs to or, or style test matchers to work as a core validation rules, but I don't know that that actually makes you know actual production use case sense. So <laughs> no one has actually ever requested it. It's just my own thing. Any plans regarding Scala check? Uh, do we have any plans for Scala check plans? No ideas, not really. Uh, certainly no objections, right? So if anyone comes up and says, "Hey, I think this should be supported," then we can have a discussion around that. So. If you think that would be useful to you, hop on the Getter channel, you know, start a discussion. I'd like, love to have it. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Um, right, so I had actually uh, a bunch of other submissions. I sort of assumed we'd be voting and stuff, but I guess that didn't happen. So uh, really, I have two things on offer. I can do one, two, or none. So, uh, show of hands, anyone interested in 20 minutes on how uh, storage works, hard drives, mechanical storage? Okay. Oh, seems like far less than half the audience, so let's skip that, I guess. Uh, another thing I can do is a, a condensed version of a talk I gave a couple days ago contrasting Java, oh, basically trying to answer the question, you know, Java 8 is out, is Scala still relevant? Obviously, since I'm here, the answer is yes, but you know, there's like actual examples of things you cannot do with Java that you might want to do in Scala. So is that interesting? Okay, that seems to be a bit more, um, a bit more involved, so let's go with that. You have the slides for the hard drive talk? For the? Hard drive talk? Yes. Are you sure that we'll the yeah, I haven't uploaded the SlideShare yet because SlideShare has a weird issue with PDF imports, but I, you know, ping me up some of you by email or whatever. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to run through this uh, without the live coding stuff uh, just to give you uh, a bit of an idea. Yes? Robert, can, I your can I close my laptop? Uh, I can. This will be a bit confusing because I'm used to the presenter view, but you know, fuck it. Uh, okay, any other questions before I actually said anything with, you know, worth asking questions about? Awesome. Okay, so uh, this was a, a meetup we had in Nikopetlovsk literally a couple days ago, um, and hopefully some of it might still be relevant uh, to you guys, so a condensed version thereof. Uh, quick preface, you know, Java 8 has been in production since 2014, a lot of us have already migrated our JVMs to Java 8, as it should be. Uh, which also begs the question, you know, given that the things that Java 8 brings to the table, is Scala still relevant? Obviously, since I'm here, the answer is an emphatic yes, it is very much still relevant. And I'm going to try to convince you, or, you know, if you're already convinced, I'm going to try to give you some ammunition if you're going to be having this debate in the future uh, about why Scala is still preferable to Java in every sense of the word. So, a bit of a history. We're going to be covering uh, just a little bit about the, the gaps between Java 8 and Scala. Uh, historically, and you know, between Java and Scala historically and today, uh, we're going to talk about how Java 8 reduces that gap to something worth discussing, and then we'll showcase, I'll probably pick just one or two of these uh, to showcase differences between Scala and Java. So, historically, uh, you know, Scala has this huge feature set that Java does not, but really, uh, in terms of Java 7 and below, you can uh, reduce the discussion to six major kind of features that Scala offers over Java. 
And those are type inference, lambdas, traits, the collections library, DSLs, and implicits. Right? There's a whole bunch of others, like macros, like you know, the whole ecosystem around Scala, but really these are kind of the six major uh, selling points, I feel, uh, for pre-Java 8 Java developers. Uh, now, Java 8 came out uh, a couple years ago, and you know, it added lambdas, it added uh, the, the streams API, which is sort of analogous to the collections library and you know, about as powerful. And uh, it added the fault method interfaces that could be argued uh, remove the need for traits. It could be argued because it's flat out wrong, and I'm going to argue with that in a second. Um, just a quick refresher, you know, there's these six features, but actually Stella offers you all of these things that you cannot get in Java. So everything from higher kind of types to declaration site vari variants to macros. You know, all of these are really nice things. Let's focus on the big, you know, the big wins. So why should you care, right? Why, why is Scala still preferable to Java? Uh, let's, let's talk about traits. Right, and let's talk about a, a canonical use case and a very simple one and a very easy to understand one for traits. I'm not going to be talking about linearization order or you know, composition or initialization order. Screw that. Let's talk about logging. So you have this Java class, written in Java 7, Java 8, looks about the same. You have your uh, SLF4J imports, you have your class of logs that defines a private logger, you have a, a very stupid uh, method that normalizes names. You know, it doesn't really do anything, it's just a, an example, artificial one of that. And, it, you know, it writes some stuff to the logs. And unfortunately, there are two very, 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 well, problematic things with this bit of code. The first is, there's a heck of a lot of boilerplate. Right, so if you're writing server code and you're using logging, and a lot of you are writing server code, and by definition you do a lot of logging, that means that pretty much every class in your however big server code base could be 100,000 lines of code, could be 1,000 classes, could be 10,000 classes. For every single class, you have to do this. You have to do these imports, and you have to define a static logger which, you know, obviously is annoying. Uh, the second and arguably much more important difference, or, or problem, if you will, is that you have eager evaluation of your uh, logging messages. So if you're, say, uh, receiving an object in JSON format and you're just dumping it to your log in the bug, in the bug level, which is something a lot of us do for, you know, for debugging reasons, for uh, a, a whole host of reasons, just you know, doing that serialization, deserialization, putting strings together, it becomes expensive, right? Especially if it's a, in a hot path in your application. It's just very, very costly. You don't want to do that if you don't have to. So in effect, this is actually kind of a lie, because in reality, production code would have something like if log is debug enabled, only then will you log the debug message that you construct on the fly, right? And that, that kind of sucks, right? You're, you have those diffs strewn around your code base, you have indentations, everything just becomes you know, big for no reason at all. So the problem, so with Java 8, you can get a little bit closer to what Scala offers you, but ideally what you would want to have is something like this. Public class logging samples implements logging, it removes the need for log dot, it removes a lot of boilerplate, and if you could, you would want to have it uh, lazily evaluated, so that only when the bug logging is actually enabled, you you know you get to see your log messages and you pay the cost for uh, for stringing all the strings together. Uh, unfortunately, you can't really do that. So Java interfaces added in Java 8 something called default method interfaces, which allows you to define a method in an interface and give it a default implementation. So, at first glance, this might appear to be a partially implemented interface, which is kind of the, the way most people perceive Stella traits, right? But in effect, not really, because you cannot carry state, and you need a logger instance, right? So, you have your public interface logging, and you end up having to define a getter for the log instance just to be able to provide a logger to the internal implementation that is, uh, that is defined within the interface, right? And once you do that, you've actually lost most of the benefits because you still have the boilerplate, right? You still have to implement the getter that goes to the log manager and brings in a log and, and feeds it into the rest of the infrastructure, which, you know, kind of defeats the purpose. Um, so 
the, the other problem is that uh, Java interfaces only, only, only provide public interfaces. Right? You cannot have private members, protected members, you cannot have state, as we mentioned before. Uh, so all these debug and warn and info, et cetera, et cetera, helper functions are visible outside of your class. They're visible to the users of that class, which obviously is a bad idea. Right? So in practice, you cannot have your logger trait in Java 8, no matter how much you want. One thing that Java 8 does do is it, it gives you some facilities for lazy evaluation. So with, uh, with lambdas, you can use this um, supplier functional interface to kind of mimic lazy evaluation. Um, you know, not kind of, right? It is basically lazy to evaluate it, except the syntax and the, user, the usage side is a bit annoying. You have to have these open and close parentheses and the arrow, but you know, it's not too bad. This is something that you can sort of live with. Obviously, the other alternative is to use formatting strings, which actually has the, the interesting side effect of if you're logging with formatting strings, and certainly if you're doing the bug logging, and then what typically happens is something breaks, you enable logs, then and only then do you actually find, find out that you've forgotten a placeholder in your logging code, in your format string, and then actually once you enable the bug log, your server will throw exceptions in every single request because you know you screwed up the logging and no one tests logging, right? You don't have unit tests for your logs. Why would you? It's a waste of time. Right, so do not use format strings. They're inherently unsafe and inherently stupid. So this, this sort of improves matters in Java 8, but that is literally the best you can do. Uh, with Scala, you have know, traits, and traits, you know, a lot of people think about them as partially implemented interfaces, and that's fine. You know, you, can, you don't have to go all out and conserve them modules and, you know, figure out the linearization order and all that stuff. Uh, but it does allow you to have state. A trait has life cycle, right? It has it has a constructor body. You can you can initialize fields. You can do all that stuff. Uh, it supports visibility modifiers. It's basically a form of multiple inheritance that's actually mostly type safe, right? Uh, I'm sure some of the smarter people in the audience, I'm looking at you, Dimitri, can find ways to break the type system soundness of traits. In effect, in production day to day, I have not run into a situation where I, I really badly screwed up my, my code base because of initialization work. Um, so a logging trait would look like this. Trait logging creates a private value of logger, and then it offers these warn or debug or whatever methods that are protected. And the message parameter is by name. So it looks very, very simple, but it actually gets lazily evaluated, which is exactly what we want. So this is a very straightforward kind of everyday thing that you would want to have that you cannot implement in Java 8. So, you know, it is what it is. All right, the questions around this? No, okay, this is pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, pattern matching I'm not going to show because I'm assuming that people in the, in the, Stella, uh, in the Stella conference actually know their stuff, so blah, 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 blah. Um, Implicit is actually a, a very, very nice property of Scala. It can be a little daunting for people first coming from the Java world. But, um, you know, let's not go into too much, you know, haywire ways of using implicit. Instead, let's talk about something that is very common in, in the Java world, which is serialization. Right, so serialization basically is a, is a three-step process. You have your domain class, and you do some sort of reflective process on it to figure out what are the components. Right? You have your domain class, you need to figure out what are the properties, right? and what are the types of the properties. So there's a reflection process going on. The second step is you dispatch. Right? You iterate over your components, and you dispatch to the right type serialization based on type. So if you have a member that is a first name that is a string, you dispatch to a string serializer. If it's you know some other domain object that you've already reflected on, you dispatch to that. There is this uh, recursive process of dispatch. You aggregate your results and eventually you know profit. Right? You're done with the serialization. Uh, thing is, in Java, you really don't have too many options. Basically, the go-to library in Java is Jackson, uh, which I assume most of you have used in the past, and a lot of you probably still do. You know, it works. It's 
fast enough. It's, it's pretty performant. It does a lot of aggressive caching to reduce the runtime reflection overhead. It's okay. Um, but it's ugly. Right? So it's ugly for a, a variety of reasons. First of all, runtime reflection is very hard to predict. So a lot of things, like you're working in a static impact language. That means that you do not want to be able to compile code that operates at runtime. And the, the whole point of having a statically compiled language is to reduce the surface of errors that you can have at runtime that you would have been able to detect at compile time. But <laughs> any serialization mechanism based on runtime reflection is inherently risky, right? It's almost broken. It's very hard to predict. Uh, it, it loses data because of, among other things, erasure. So if you've tried serializing to serializing options or maps uh, with Jackson, you need to do some hacker around it and set up the proper modules in your uh, object mapper and other uh, annoying things. Um, and you know it might be pluggable via modules, but it's really easy to forget. You know you didn't set up your object mapper right. You get an exception at runtime, which sucks. Right, so um, you end up either accepting the possibility of exceptions at runtime, which is not what you want to do, or writing tests for code that is essentially very, very simple and should not have compiled in the first place if it was not correct. Uh, and that kind of sucks. So with Scala, you know, you, you use implicits, right? You use type classes. You use your serialization type class, serializer type class, and you let the compiler figure out the correct wiring of serializers. And the nice, uh, you know, a nice property of that is not only that you can do the reflection at compile time, so if you've used PlayJSON, for instance, you probably use the formats macro or the writes or the reads macros. All these things do are, is essentially the same reflective process that Jackson will do at runtime except at compile time. They look at your case lesson, they figure out the structure, and then they produce the appropriate description for you know, subsequent uh, serialization logic. And the wiring just happens by the compiler. So the dispatch, the, the serialization dispatch that says I have this address class, I need to dispatch to an address serialization, happens via implicit search. And that means that at compile time, if your serialization framework does not know how to handle a particular type, it immediately breaks during compilation. It just tells you I cannot find an implicit serializer of whatever particular type uh, you try to use and have not defined. And you do not have to write tests or you know or, or do slow tests for your serialization code, right? You get compile time safety. Um, it also has the added benefit of being faster, right? Because you do not do compile time ref uh, runtime reflection, and you do not have to do code generation to avoid reflective access to your objects. So it saves you space on the well, not not the perm gen anymore, but the meta space, right? It has all these benefits because all happens at compile time and it's safer. Right? So this is the preferred solution. You, you literally, sorry, I just basically said all this thing. Um, this is the preferred solution, right? If you're running in Scala, you can do this. If you're running in Java, you cannot do this. Or you have to add external tools to your build pipeline just to get the same benefits you know, at compile time instead of at runtime. Uh, how is that better? You know, better performance, better reliability, which is kind of what we want, right? Write less code, write simpler code, get more safety out of your compiler, get better runtime performance, big win. So all of the Scala serialization, typically JSON, because that's what everyone uses these days, that's what all cool kids who hate that SNL do, right? Um, all serialization frameworks, including PlayJSON, including SprayJSON, including LiftJSON back in the day, JSON Trust, work based on off of the same pattern with you know very subtle implementation differences. They're all the same. And I guess that's enough for now. So thank you very much. If there are any questions any any questions? Oh here's one. So, so in your example when you were were trying to mimic the logging example from Java Actually, this because of the way how traits are compiled, there is one difference which is left. In Scala, you have a logger field in every instance of the class. In Java, you had it static. Yes. So it means that in Scala, your values will actually have a bigger number of footprints. True. So do you know a way around this? 
So uh, did everyone get that, or should I repeat the question? Yeah, seems good. Seems right, so in Java you can do it statically. In Scala, because of the because it's logging trait, uh, you did it, you know, not as a static member, but as, a, as an actual instance member. Is there a way around that? Certainly there are ways. Uh, you could have that uh, logging. You could have two separate traits that compose into a logging thing. One is on the companion object, say, and one is on the, the actual instance trait. You can certainly do that with sort of external uh, external tools, macro annotations, a whole bunch of uh, possibilities. Uh, personally, I hate magic, and as far as I'm concerned, macro annotations are kind of magic. Not only that, but they also add a, uh, a compile time dependency and a compiler plugin in your downstream dependencies, which is something that is, Accord doesn't do that, by the way, but the library that I mentioned has zero dependencies. Um, and I don't think it's worth it. So really, uh, if you have so many allocations of a specific type of class where this matters to you in terms of memory footprint or even runtime performance footprint, you're probably doing something wrong, um, or you can just, you know, not use the logging trait in that specific context. Uh, ways around it? Yes. Should you use them? Probably not. I mean, it's in effect, it's not really a big deal for almost all use cases. Would you have liked it if you had a static, a way to create static fields and static methods in Scala? Would I have liked it if I had a way to create static fields and static methods? Well, I have a way. It's called the companion object, yeah, right? But uh, if I had a way to do that sort of automatically through a trait on the instance class, I guess I would have to actually see the mechanism to figure out if I like it or not, because I can't really envision something that, is, that does that and is still clean and sensible. But surely, you know, someone might come up with, with some way of doing that. Uh, if there was, sure. Yeah, oh, but you can influence, you know, we can uh, ask for it. There is. There is, okay. I'd, I'd love to see that afterwards. Not in the at static annotation, which by the fact how mixing components works, happened to work this way in Ritz. Oh, okay, interesting. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward for, uh, to Dottie for a variety of reasons. This would probably be one of the more minor ones, but I'm still very much looking forward to it. Okay, any other questions or complaints? You want to kill me? <laughs> that's, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, who's next? So we have here Daniel Coldham, uh, who also happens to work for Wix, and he's talking about event sourcing. Hooray! Yes, you're next. <laughs> 